I'm working hard on my project, but I feel like I'm wasting my time. I feel like I'm spinning my wheels. Today, as we stand on the doorstep of a new year, 2024, I want to invite you to look with me at a portion of the Christmas story again today that I propose offers us four strategies for gaining what I call legacy traction in our life. Four strategies to help us keep ourselves from spinning our wheels. And so the story that we're going to unpack, again, is found in Matthew chapter 2. I'm going to start reading at verse 1. As always, try to picture the scene in your mind. Try to put yourself into the situation and then try to apply sort of what we're reading together. So Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, this is what we're told. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men, or magi, from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. Now write this down, strategy number one in your app notes. Brothers and sisters, if you want to gain legacy traction in your life, if you want to make progress in in such a way where you're not spinning your wheels in 2014, then I think it's important for you and me to live with what I call an explorer's mentality. Strategy number one, live with an explorer's mentality. You know, here in our Bible story, we are introduced to some magi, some Persian astrologers who apparently they notice this star in the sky, which piques their curiosity. You know, the Bible doesn't say this, but I I, I think it's safe for us to assume. And I, I suspect that after some, maybe some dialogue amongst themselves, this group of wise men make this decision to set out on what we might call a, a legacy journey. It's a journey that that is literally is going to change their life and and most likely their spiritual worldview. These magi, these wise men, we are told, are on the hunt to find and worship the newborn king of the Jews. Now, I don't know if the magi had any idea how long their journey was going to take them. The Bible doesn't say But what we are told here in verse 1 is that they are traveling from eastern lands. And most Bible scholars suggest that these wise men are traveling from what we would know as the region of Babylon. And so when you look at the map and you look at the distance between Babylon and and the region of Babylon and, and Bethlehem or Jerusalem to where they're heading, we can ascertain that these Wise men are traveling approximately 900 miles to get from their point A to point B, a trip that would likely have taken them several months. Now, don't miss this. The fact that these magi make this trip, which undoubtedly certainly had to involve a number of obstacles and surprises, showcases for me at least how these wise men are definitely living their life and approaching their life with what I call an explorer's mentality. So personalize this. As you stand on the doorstep of a new year, right? Are you approaching 2024 with an explorer's mentality? Are you expecting God to lead you on any new adventures? You know, Morgan, you're thinking about colleges right now. Not to call you out, but I'm going to call you out. You know, as you think about college, how many of you went to college? College is filled with new adventures, right? What are we expecting for you this year, Morgan? I think good things, new adventures. So I want you to pray a a growth prayer with me right now. So put your hands open. This is an explorer's mentality prayer. Take a deep breath in. And every time I pray this prayer, and we pray this oftentimes, we'll say, Lord, more of you in my life, right? Deep breath in. And as a deep exhale out, we say, less of me, more of you, less of me. Now in your heart, pray this. Say, Heavenly Father, I want to grow this coming year. Say, I want to grow, God, in my understanding of the Bible. I want to be more patient with people. 
I want to be more generous with my stuff. I want to be a more enthusiastic encourager with my words, yes? So say, please help me, God, this coming year to live my life with an explorer's mentality. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Okay, good. Let's keep reading. Verse 3. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, what the Magi were asking, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, where's this Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem, search carefully for the child, and when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. Now write this down, strategy number two. A second strategy, brothers and sisters, for for gaining legacy traction in our life is to assess and reassess. Assess and reassess. Translation, welcome input. Welcome input. In our Bible story, we read how a star leads these wise men to Jerusalem, right? Upon their arrival, the Bible writer describes how immediately they head to the palace to have a conversation with the ruling king, King Herod. These wise men understand, and they're illustrating for us, their understanding of soliciting input, of assessing and reassessing information. The Magi, as most of you know, and we've talked about this in previous weeks, they would have been well received by King Herod because Magi were commonly found in the company of kings. Their wisdom, as as we've talked about before, was highly, it was a highly sought out commodity. Magi were experts in the study of science, astrology, diplomatic relations, and, and even religion. And so their advice was trusted, their counsel was heeded, which we see King Herod demonstrating here in verse 3 when he seeks the input, right, of his religious, the local experts in his town, like, where is this, there's, where's this boy, where's this newborn king supposed to be born? So I want you to personalize this, this situation. What do you think God has in store for you this coming calendar year? You know, are you hungry and you're, are you eager to to grow? Are you approaching this new year with sort of this attitude of of anticipation? You know, for some of you, maybe you experienced some setbacks this past year. Maybe for some of you, 2023 involved a, a career change for you, or maybe some of you got fired from a job. Maybe this past year, for some of you here, those of you tuning online, maybe your, your life experiences involved some kind of a relational breakup or a relational change. And now you find yourself in a season of transition, right? Maybe for some of you this past year, you committed a sin and that you've asked God to forgive and you know God's asked, forgiven you for it, and yet somehow you just have a hard time forgiving yourself. You have a hard time maybe moving forward, and and so now you're not even sure how to move forward. We've talked about this before, and we see this illustrated here in the Magi's practice. Don't try to navigate these next steps of your life alone. Rather, follow the example of these wise men in our story. Seek out the counsel of those who maybe can give you some input to help you get unstuck, to help keep you and prevent you from spinning your what? Your wheels. You know, at the end of our conversation today, I'm going to ask for your help with something. I'm going to have a big ask for you to join me on an adventure that's going to, I'm going to ask you to pray specifically for three things 
So get ready because it's going to be, it's going to be great. But let's keep reading and then we'll get to that. Verse 9, this is what we're told. So after this interview with King Herod, the wise men went their way and the star that they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house. Notice that. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary. And they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. After the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, flee to Egypt with a child and his mother, the angel said. Stay there until I tell you to return, because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Last verse. That night, Joseph left for Egypt, and the child and Mary, his mother, and they stayed there until Herod's death. Verse 16, Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under, based on the wise man's report of the star's first appearance. You know, these Bible verses that we just read have created quite a bit of debate among theologians, Bible scholars. You know, many theologians have suggested that because these wise men, or because Matthew, the gospel writer here, tells us that these wise men follow a, this, this star that appears and reappears, right? And moves and directs them to this precise location where Jesus was. Many believe that this star was actually an angel that was leading the way. Have you ever considered or discussed that possibility? You know, the suggestion that the star was an angel, in my opinion, uh, isn't that far-fetched when you consider the truth of what we're told here is how God used an angel to announce Mary that she was going to be pregnant, right? And God announced uh, to Joseph on four different occasions in a dream through with an angel, we're told, of, of, you know, to make decisions about what to do or what to, what to do next, such as what we see here in verse 13. If you look at it, an angel of the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream. And so I think it's just interesting question to ponder is was this star actually an angel? So there's some lunch conversation for you to have today. But here's what I find really interesting especially as it relates to identifying strategies for us to gain, gain traction in our life. I propose that the third strategy that this Bible story showcases that these wise men practice is a willingness to modify their road trip itinerary. Strategy number three, modify as necessary. You know, these magi, we're told, had originally planned to return to, Her to Jerusalem, right? To have this conversation with Herod, to give him intel as to where baby Jesus was. But the Bible writer tells us that after a dream where they're warned not to return to Herod, we read here how the wise men modify their route home. So brothers and sisters... Ponder this. How hard is it for you to modify your plans? To pivot? To adjust and adapt to new circumstances? An important strategy for gaining legacy traction in our lives, I think, involves a willingness and an openness to adjust our roadmap. And I was thinking about that, Millie, when we were getting the text about the car last night. Whoop, time to modify. Do you believe, brothers and sisters, that God's plan for your life is rigid? Do you believe that God has one career path for you? Or do you think that God is somewhat flexible? You think God's okay with you working a variety of different jobs over the course of your life? What do you think? Yes or no? How many think yes? How many think no? Okay. 
You know, I always tell people this, college students this, and what you've heard me say before is, I think a, a college degree is like a ticket to a movie theater, right? You get a movie ticket, you go into the theater to go see Men in Black 3, and then you realize, oh, good, there's a Star Wars 14. I'm going to go there, too. They give you the ticket. You get in the movie theater, but actually the, the movie you do, oh, you, you change the direction. I think that's what college does. We go, we get a career path, we get a degree, but in reality, most of us do something completely different, right? But it's a ticket. It's, it's a tool. And I think that's how God works sometimes. You know, one of my life convictions is that God gives us experiences to simply prepare us for something else. You know, it's my conviction that God might ultimately want you or me at point D over here, but for us to get there, it's not a straight line, right? We got to go to point A to point B to point C before we can get to point where? D. We need all these experiences to help us prepare for what he really has in store for us. And maybe that's something that some of you need to hear today. Maybe when you look back over your life for this past year, you just feel like, man, there's been all these obstacles and these detours and these unexpected twists and you know, turns in my life. And, and you realize God's got a plan here. Are you willing to modify the plan? Live with an explorer's mentality. Assess and reassess modify as necessary as your road trip circumstances change and then strategy number four write this down keep moving keep learning keep growing and do it in community keep moving keep learning keep growing and do it in community that's one of the purposes of the church is for us to do life together the wise men were told originally planned to return to Jerusalem to give Herod some intel, right? Here's where baby Jesus is. But after being warned in a dream to return to a different route, after meeting Jesus and worshiping him, we can see how they modify their plan. Illustrating to me that they're still living with an explorer's mentality. They're moving, they're learning, they're growing, and they're doing it in community. And I propose, brothers and sisters, that God wants you and me to do the same. So think about this. Who in your world do you invite to speak into decisions that you need to make? You know, this past Thursday, I'll give you a couple of examples personally. This past Thursday, I had a financial conversation with Lisa Banning, one of our church trustees, about a decision, that I, some information I was needing. I, and so I sought Lisa's input. On Friday, the very next day, I was with Kirk Bauermeister, one of our church elders. And Kirk is often the guy that I go to when I'm making decisions about anything involving civic engagement or community. Because as you know, Kirk's in the school district and this happened to deal with the school district situation. And so I went to Kirk to solicit his input to help me gain some sort of some clarity. You know, this past month, one of the decisions I've been wrestling with is whether or not I should stop playing basketball, which I've been doing for pretty much my whole life, 58 years. I can remember a five-year-old really picking up the sport, and during those high school days when my dad and I wouldn't get along, I'd go out on the side of the house and I would shoot for three or four hours. And, and, and the game of basketball for me has been such a big sport that's helped me travel the country, you know, North America, all over the country, experiencing so many different things. And so to finally hang up my, my jock strap, so to speak, hang up, hang up my shoes, it's a big deal. And I might have shed a tear or two when I sent out an email email to these guys who I've been playing basketball with for the last 24 years every Friday. Transition. But before I, before, but, you know, life modification, I was, before I sent out my email, I was having a conversation with my friend and chiropractor, Dr. Gregory Wood, who's one of the guys who's helped keep me on the basketball court. And I said, Greg, I, I'm really struggling with this decision. My body's starting to break down, and I kind of want to walk off on my own two feet and not on crutches. And Gray just said, Mike, life's filled with modification. He calls it life modification. And that's what we see here in this, in this Bible story. 
Friends, to gain legacy traction in your life, live with an explorer's mentality, assess and reassess, Modify your roadmap as, as circumstances change, as your knees start to break down, and then keep moving, keep growing, keep learning, and do it in what? Community. Community. So let's say one final prayer, and then I'm going to tell you a story. Okay? Palms open. Heart open. Mind open. Just take a deep breath in again and say, God, fill me up today with your spirit. Exhale. Bless me. Now say this, Heavenly Father, please grow me in this new year. And please give me fruitful traction on my life goals. Please help me to keep moving, to keep learning, to keep growing, and to do it in community with the help and support of my Palm Harvest family. Okay, one more prayer. To God, I want my life and my legacy to have traction. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Good. What time is it? Oh, I'm early. You got time for one more story? There's three things that I want you to play, pray for starting today, and I'm going to have you write these down at the end of this little dialogue or monologue, I guess. Three things that as a church family, I want you to be aware of, but I want to give it, set the context for you. Okay, so settle in on this. This story that I'm going to tell you is a true one. And it involves, in fact, I'm going to sit down here for this. Let me put my Bible over here. It involves the family of Beto and Millie Gudino, who many of you know. Beto and Millie are from Mexico, right? You guys know that. They were born there, they have family there. But before Beto was born, he has two uncles and a great aunt who live here in Costa Mesa. And in the early 1960s, Beto's two uncles, who are brothers to Elena, and his great aunt, who is her, her aunt, they became citizens of the United States, 1960s. As Beto was growing up, as you can imagine, as a kid in Mexico, he would come back and forth visiting his, his family. In 1999, now a little bit older, having given his life to Jesus, Beto, in this very church, was baptized. There's a baptismal tank right behind this wall right here. And Beto, visiting his uncles, became friends with the Parra family. Pastor Christian Parra is the senior pastor of Iglesia Harbor, which is the mothership of this campus. He and, they've been friends for like 30 years now. But Beto came to this church, got baptized in 1999. Okay, so I'm going to give you a chron chron chronology here. Pre-Palm Harvest Days, long history with this church, returns to Mexico. Two years later, in 2001, Beto's uncles, citizens of Costa Mesa, citizens for at this point, what, 30, 40 years, officially petitioned for Beto and his brother and sister to become citizens of the United States. That's one of the things that our government does that allows us to sponsor people or petition people. And when Beto, upon their application in 2001, Beto received what many have called the golden ticket. It was like a six-month period where the government were issuing these golden tickets, which basically is like a Disneyland fast pass, apparently, that's supposed to help you move through the immigration process. That was 2001. And for the past 23 years... Beto is still waiting for the opportunity to get his green card. 23 years. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, and this is where I've learned about our, our system. Well, I'll get to that. Let me get... In 2005, in response to his uncle's invitation, I want you to know this, 
Beto moved from California to, or from, from Mexico to California to Costa Mesa illegally to start working. Here's what I've learned about the United States. We have a messed up system. Do you know that here in the United States, a person can, while they're maybe not allowed to be a citizen, our government will issue what is called an I-10 number. It's an individual taxpayer identification number. Basically what that means is you can come into the country, you can work, we want you to pay your taxes, but it's not your green card, it's not your citizenship. You have, you, you risk the, 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 I guess the risk is being deported back to where you live, and yet we're super glad for you to work 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years with this I-10 number. We love to take your money, we love to take your tax money, which Beto's been paying for year after year after year after year. But just know that if, when it comes time for you to get old and retire, there's gonna be no, there's gonna be no pension. You get a benefit from the, you know, the good streets and the hospitals and and whatnot, but we'll take your money, but that's as far as it goes. And you can go down, literally, you can go down to the office in almost a day, a single day, you can get an I-10 number to start working to pay your taxes. But to get your, your citizenship and your green card, not so easy. Our government is messed up. It's fraudulent. So with, with his new I-10 number, Beto starts to work. The following year, in 2006, Millie, Beto's new, now wife, but at this point they're still single. She moves from Mexico to California to work and like Beto, she too came across our border illegally. Now, what you may or may not know about Millie is that she was a professor at the university in Guadalajara. Did you know that about Millie? And while she was a professor at the university, in one of her classes, Beto was a student. Now, Beto remembers meeting her, remembers turning in an assignment and thinking, wow, she's really cute. But Millie has no recollection of Beto, you know. She's got, you know, plenty of, of students. And, but so when she comes in a year later, in 2006, through a mutual friend, she and Beto are introduced, they start to date, and two years later, in 2008, they get married and start having a family, okay? Like the Magi, here's what I want you to understand in our Bible story, the Gudinos are on this legacy journey. Fast forward five years. Beto and Millie are living in Costa Mesa. In 2013, Palm Harvest Church, we make a transition. We, re we re relocate from Costa Mesa High School onto this campus. Two years later, there's a funeral here on campus. Pastor Christian Parra, who's the, the pastor of Iglesia Harbor, he and I, I remember this day so clearly, he and I are standing at the back doors there, we're talking about what's going on, and Pastor uh, Chris was officiating this, this funeral, when this young man carrying this guitar with this, this long hair comes walking in, and he comes up here to the stage, and, I, and Chris introduced us, he said, Mike, this is a friend of mine, Beto Gudino, and I, hi, Beto, I'm Mike, and he gets up here to the stage, and he's, and he's tuning his guitar, I turned to Chris, and I said, is he, is the, is he in? any good? Is that kid any good? And, and Chris goes, oh yeah, he's really good. Now what Beto didn't know, uh, but he was about to find out, is that at that time I was on the hunt for a new worship leader. And so it was Saturday, it was a Saturday, Beto's up here tuning, and, and I said, hey, hey Beto, I said, what are you doing tomorrow? I'm at the back, I scream, you know, hey, what are you doing? Uh, nothing. I said, you want to come to Palm Harvest and help lead worship? And he goes, sure. So the next day he shows up, I think Millie was there, at that time they had uh, Joseph and Dorian, Melody was still in the oven, Millie, uh, Millie was pregnant with Melody, 2015, and over the next year, Beto began, intermittently began to help us here with worship at Palm Harvest Church, still working with his I-10 number, as, as, as confusing as this is, paying his taxes every year to the government, working and we started to increase his hours. So in 2017, we as a church board decided we need to get involved in this immigration thing. Right? They got this young family. And so we, with Beto's golden ticket and $8,500, 
we get this lawyer who is really effective at bringing in like uh, musicians and, and professional athletes and stuff that Beto had contacts with in Beverly Hills. Doug Jackson and I, we, we go to Beverly Hills, we meet with this, this uh, lawyer by the name of Umberto Gray, and when he learns that Beto has this golden ticket, and these were his words, he said, your immigration is a slam dunk. Those were his words. No problem, we got you. And so, 2017, we start this immigration application. Two years later, I'm sitting at my desk. I remember this day so clearly because I had a pair of wire cutters in my hands. I was working on this uh, outlet in my office and I was stripping some wires and uh, the mail came in and, and, and I laid it on my desk and as I'm, I opened the mail and there's, my desk is covered with wires and all these things from this electrical project I was working on. As I'm reading the letter, it's a letter of denial. They say, we've denied your request for Beto to become a... a to start on this green card application, in part because part of Beto's job description that we had to have in terms of his worship leader was we had him uh, included in his job description was uh, construction projects around campus here. If you know anything about Beto, he's a very skilled tile worker. He's really good with, with, with uh, wood. And so I said, Beto, as you start to put more hours in, there's probably going to be a project or two that you, you can work on here on this campus. Uh, and, and, you know, as, as a pastor, I've, 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 I've uh, done hurricane relief work all over the country, tornado relief work. We've built homes in Mexico. Being, doing construction part projects, it's just part of what I do as a pastor. It's right, part of working in a church and a court. But according to the this immigration worker, the reason we were denied is because church people don't do, church workers don't do construction projects. I thought, isn't that interesting? As I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm an ordained pastor. I got my doctorate. I got a pair of electrical pinchers in my hand working on an electric project, but apparently I'm not supposed to do this because that's not what pastors do. So we immediately appeal. We said, this is messed up. Clearly, this immigration worker, this decision maker, doesn't understand or has a limited perspective of what some pastors do, at least. Certainly what Palm Harvest is. We're a roll-up-your-sleeves-get-her-done kind of church community. Uh, that's who we are. Uh, we're going to appeal with our golden ticket. Two years later, 2019, we get the news, no bueno. We don't approve it. So that same year, 2019, with checkbook in hand, we committed to round number three, to Beto's immigration journey. Now, fortunately for us, like the Magi, with God's help, we continue to, we are, right now, we are approaching this journey with the explorer's mentality. We've been assessing and reassessing. We've been modifying the plan. You know, when COVID changed, you know, job, Beto's basically job description changed because suddenly now, he, as you tell, he's leading worship, but Beto's behind the camera. He's doing social media. And the, and the lawyer said, you know, he's not even doing the same thing that he first did when he came. We, we need to go out at, at this through a different angle. So since 2019 until today, five years, we're still in the application process. There's been all these hoops for us to jump through, which we've been doing, but basically what I want you to hear, which brings us me to the close of this conversation and the prayer request that I have, is we are about to submit this application after a 25-year waiting period with this golden ticket, and next month, as we're kind of putting the, crossing the T's and dotting our I's, we are going to resubmit round number three, this application, with the hope that this young man and his wife, who are shareholders and they roll up your sleeves, make, add value holders to our, our country, can get an opportunity to get their green card. So here's what I'm asking for you to join me on. Three things specifically that I want us to pray for, okay? So write these down. Number one, wisdom for our legal team. Wisdom for our legal team. Clearly, the system is intricate. Wisdom for our legal team. This past week, they, 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 the legal team, we were working with a, a, someone on the team, and they said, hey, we need this information from you. And I, and I told Beto, I said, 
ask him what the context is. We could give you an answer, but we need to know what we're, what's the end goal here, right? We need you to take the lead and stop making the pastors take the lead on this. You need to tell us, you know. So wisdom for the legal team, number one. Second thing I need you to pray for or want you to pray for is favoritism from the government worker. You know, when we look at scripture, you can see how there are, there are passages of scripture like with Daniel and Joseph, where the government was favorable, where there were good relationships between the king and some of his workers. And then you have the story of like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who get tossed in the fire, right? Because things aren't going so good. And so we know that God is ultimately in control. Do you believe that? Yes or no? Yes. And so we, my simple prayer is that we get a government person who's going to assess this uh, this uh, application with a bigger understanding of what being a part of the church is and that they don't come in with this oh that's not the job of a, a church worker church workers don't do construction church workers don't sit when they preach right all I'm asking is God give us somebody who can look at this honestly and with a favorably hopefully a Christian there are Christian people who work for the government, believe it or not, and we want one of them. And then the third thing is success. Success for a green card. How are we going to know when God answers our prayer? Is when we get a green card. So three things that will you join me and us praying for? Wisdom, favoritism, and success. You guys down for that? Let's petition God's favor because ultimately God is in control. Yes? Yes. What, so let's just, let's land the plane here and let's personalize it. What do you think 2024 is going to hold for you? For the Godinos, we're praying for wisdom, favoritism, and success. But for some of you, you might be in a place right now where you need to modify your plan. Yesterday, as most of you know, Clarence and Robin and I modified the plan. Clarence moved in with the Deckers. A little bit ahead of schedule. We were always knew it was going to come, but because of circumstances that happened yesterday, no brunch today, by the way, because our house is a little bit chaotic. Modify. We trust the Lord in this. We believe him in this. And some of you may be in a season of modification where you've been thrown, the rug's been pulled out from underneath you. It was that you had the golden ticket, but things didn't work out as you thought they were going to work out. God's saying, trust me in this. Live with an explorer's mentality. Assess and reassess. Modify and then keep moving, keep learning, keep growing and do it how? In community. So brothers and sisters, as you step from 2023 into 2024, know that you're not alone. We're in this together. And as we look to God for his help, and as we lean upon each other for advice and support, we can know that we will fulfill God's kingdom purpose for our lives and for the lives of of those we're in relationship with. So I bless you today as you move into a new year with the wisdom of the Magi, with the flexibility to modify, to assess and reassess. As you leave today and you step into 2024, in the name of God the Father, Jesus the Son, the Holy Spirit, I bless you with an increasing amount of flexibility to be value adder, adders to the people in your world I love you, brothers and sisters, and I pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, my Savior and Lord. Amen and amen and amen. Have a great week. Happy New Year. We'll see you next Sunday. God bless you.